making it tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. My name is Sam Gaby. Um, I am the president of this year's chapter of Mortar Board, uh, and I have the great honor of introducing Dean Frost, our keynote speaker for the last lecture series. Um, a quick announcement, we have some H cookies and waters, so anytime during the lecture, if you want to go get some, please feel free. <laughs> the more the merrier, I think it's good. Just go <laughs> that ahead. Um, and we will also have a short Q&A after the lecture, um, so I just would encourage you all to stay for that. Um, this event is sponsored by both Mortar Board and Student Congress, so I'd like to thank both of these groups um, for the effort they have put into tonight's event. Uh, the last lecture series title is usually rhetorical. The lectures are usually not literally presented as the last lecture the speaker will deliver at Hope, but are meant to highlight the advice that faculty and staff would most want to share as if the event was indeed their final opportunity to address the college's students. The speakers are asked to reflect on their careers and lives and to think deeply about what matters to them and the wisdom that they would like to impart. However, in this specific case, um, Dean Frost is retiring after the semester ends. Uh, it only seemed fitting to ask Dean Frost to speak at this year's last lecture. Dean Frost has faithfully served Hope College for 33 years, previously coming from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dean Frost started as, at Hope as the Dean of Students and is now the Vice President for Student Development and Dean of Students. In his role, he mentors and guides the student body and oversees student development services on campus. Dean Frost, on behalf of Mortar Board, I would like to thank you for agreeing to speak at tonight's event. But I would also personally like to thank you for everything that you have done for this college in the past 33 years. You will be deeply missed. If you will all join me in welcoming Dean Frost. Um, this could be a long evening or a short evening. Um, um, for me, this is something that I never thought would come my way. Um, and I'm very appreciative to Mary and, and Sam and Mortar Board for the privilege and, and honor to do this. Um, before I begin, I think it, it's only fitting that I um, give thanks um, because I do not stand here because of what, who I am or what I am singularly. Um, I believe it's important to give thanks to those that have made me who I am and continue to pour into me and, and who I am. For me, I start with my mom and dad and, and my, my sister, um, who's here with her husband, uh, Bob, um, and, and my other sister and brother who are not here. Um, they have been kind of those rocks. I've had huge mentors across my career, um, dating back to when I started at Michigan State in my graduate program, um, all the way through to today and we'll, we'll for the rest of my time at the college. There's a person by the name of Dr. James Beckering, and Dr. J James Beckering was the Vice President for Student Development and Admissions when, I, and when he hired me back in 1989. Um, and I'm not sure he knew what he got, um, but what I'll say is that the two students that were on the committee said they uh, liked who I was and therefore they wanted me to be the new dean. One of the things about being the dean is that you serve at the pleasure of the president. And I have had uh, the honor and privilege to work with five different presidents. President Jacobson, President Boatman, who's here, to, who, here this evening, uh, President Knapp, President Vosco, and currently a Sir President Skogan. Um, and it's always a little bit unnerving um, when you start with a new president. And um, I had done my homework about President Boatman before he came because he had been a dean here before he returned to us. And one of my first occasions that I um, did with the president was there were a few students who had gotten into a bit of trouble um, down in Allegan County. And so my first adventure with my new boss was to go down to Allegan County and meet with the prosecutor. <laughs> and so if you, if you ever want to think about a really attention-filled drive, that would be it, you know? <laughs> And, and not sure I ever uh, recovered from that, but he, he was so gracious to me, and he knew the college inside and out, and he knew every 
thing about the college, and he was so gracious to me. And, and so for me, that was one of those things that I'll always remember, plus many other stories. The, the other part for me is the leadership of Hope College has been exemplary during my 33 years, and I think there are too many to mention tonight, but I can't say enough for their, their wisdom and grace with me and, and, their, and their teaching me, which is kind of one of the things that I really appreciate. To the faculty and the rest of the Hope community, it's been a joy. Um, I mean, there are faculty here tonight who, who I uh, call friends and colleagues, um, but I think the things that they have poured onto me and taught me is really remarkable. When I think back about Dr. Harvey Blankespor, um, amazing man in, in biology, and uh, Dr. Arthur Gents in philosophy, and people like that that you students never got a chance to know. Um, Hope is one of those places that is built on the shoulders of those that have come before. And I, and I just believe that strongly because I, I didn't know about Hope a lot, um, but I have, through my 33 years, met so many of them and experienced so many of them. To my colleagues in student development, and there are a number here tonight, but there's a number who are not here, um, I can't say thanks enough. I mean, it is, I mean it's like I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I'll say, I'll take my group and we'll go to any college and university and we'll set it on its ear because you're that good. And the only reason I'm any good is because of you. Um, and I think that's really important to understand is, is that the qualities that you bring and the care for the students that you have is immense. And I couldn't have done it without you and I would not have wanted to have done it without you. In my time, there is a group of people who also work with me every day and those are my assistants. And those assistants know the true Richard Frost. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, to me, is really critical. Um, and I think I've had five assistants. The one that's had the longest tenure, tenure is Julie Dahlman. And, and Julie is that person that stuck with me in, in ways that, that I just can't say thanks enough um, to Julie um, in terms of all she's done. She threatened to organize my office. And <laughs> after five years, she gave up on that, you know. Um, <laughs> But, but I think, you know, when you have people like that, it, it's truly a gift. The last uh, thanks I want to give is to, is to my, my family. Um, my daughter, Megan, um, who is, a, um, I think, an 11 grad. And then my son, Peter, um, who is a 14 grad from Kenyon College. And then my youngest is, is Danae, who is a 16 grad from Hope. Um, thanks for, for everything you've done and do. Um, we had too many lunches and meals in Phelps and McClatts. Um, you were gracious enough to go with me to um, graduations, and baccalaureates, athletic events, um, dance marathons, and the list goes on and on. And for the three of you, you make my life exciting and meaningful. The last and the most important is thanks for my wife, Susan. Um, uh, Susan is, a, is the consummate uh, person that, that compliments me and, and makes me whole. Um, as a dean of students, you carry a phone 24-7, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do. And on more than one occasion, she's picked up the phone and answered it for me. She says, Richard, it's the police, it's the hospital. What do I need to do to help you? I just can't do it without you. And, and, you know, so for me, thank you for putting up with me. Um, thank you for allowing me to be the dean that I was and am. Um, because without you, I would not be the dean I am at all. So thank you. I love you much. So I guess now it's time to have the, the lecture and the lessons. As I began, one of the things that I sat down once Sam and Mary had talked to me as I began thinking about students, and this is the first of five pages of student names. And each one of those students, I could tell you a story and a lesson that they've taught me. And I think one of the things in my world is, is that it's always been about you as students. And I've always been appreciative of the stories that you bring and the things that you brought to me. And I think those are things that are really, really important, is that we all have stories. The thing that I worry about sometimes is we don't take time for those stories. And over my 33 years, that's them. And as I look at them and as I think about them, some people will recognize some of those names. Other people will not recognize those names at all. 
Um, but they're all stories. And every one of us is important because of the stories we have. And I think for me, that's one of those things. We would be here a long time if I did my five pages. So I'm not going to do that, Sam. So I'm, you may have wanted that, but I, you gave me a time limit. So what I've chosen to do is, is I've chosen to introduce myself and my lessons through students, uh, because truly, that's who I am. In 2000, um, Diana Brecklaw was the director of student activities, and she was new to the college. And um, I, I'd known Diana's sister who went to Hope, but never Diana. And she came to me um, during her first year, and she says, Richard, I really think we need to do something um, special for students. We do lots of things in the fall. We do Nykirk, we do pole, we do these different things. But she says, I want to do something different. And she says, we want to do a dance marathon. I go, what is dance marathon? I don't like to dance. I don't want to dance. Why are we going to do a dance marathon? Long story short is what do students want? Students have taken that from the first year. It was $29,000 they raised to over $350,000. This is you. This is your story. This is taking that opportunity and doing it, right? So that was one of those kind of precursors to the rest of my story. FSAE, there's a kid by the name of Ben Barkle and Matt Labaza. And Ben Barkle and Matt Labaza came to me, and they're engineering kids. This is their freshman year. Um, and they said, we want to start a formula race car team. I have no, I am not mechanical at all. I am the worst of the mechanics, right? And so Ben and Matt said, well, we want to do this. And I said, no. And they went away. They came back their sophomore year, and I said, no. They learn really quickly, I hope. All of you learn really quickly. They didn't come back to me this year, their junior year. They just started Formula SAE. <laughs> they seized the opportunity to do that on their own, you know, and they went on their own and they did that. I mean, it's amazing what they've done. Carl Heidemann is here tonight and he is the advisor and he's just taken it to a whole different level. So thank you, Carl, for all, all that work you've done. But again, it's the students listening to themselves. It's doing that. Ben and Matt are both amazing engineers at General Motors right now, doing amazing work. One's on the electric car, the other one's on some integrated systems. And, but, the, but the things that, that it teaches and touches are really special, right? The third is Student Congress. Um, and you know, I've been involved with Student Congress um, more these past four years, five years, um, with Jason Gomery and Chandler Alberta and then Luke Rufinock as president. And I think I'm going to say st Student Congress is, is a new part of the institution in terms of the force it has and, and the seat to, seat to turn at the table. I don't have to do a whole lot because of the leadership and the students that participate in Congress. But that's true with every one of these things. And I can go through every one of the student organizations and do that as well. Right. So those are student groups, but what about students? Um, Mr. Johnny Molina um, is from the valley outside Los Angeles. Um, why would he come to Hope? His parents didn't go to college, um, but he wanted to go to college. And he wanted to go to a college that he could be part of a Christian community, and he wanted to learn. Having come from California and having lived in Santa Barbara, I can only imagine Johnny's shock, true shock, when he got to Holland, Michigan and looked around and saw tulips and trees versus the co communities that he came from. Johnny Molina found himself in pole and was an exceptional puller. His nickname was Tank. And he was this big guy and he was really wonderful. Um, he was a, huge, a wonderful person. He graduates from Hope, went to law school, and now he has his own law firm out in Corona, California, doing immigration law um, for underserved people. A number of summers ago, Johnny came back to Hope, unbeknownst to me, and walks into my office um, with his wife and two sons. I walk out of my office, I go, Tank, and Johnny turns to his wife and I said, I told you so. You know, why do we have Johnny? 
He seized an opportunity and did it. Amina Wallace uh, came in 2015, graduated in 2015. Amina was a Phelps scholar. She was political science. She was an RA. She did immersion trips. She was literally amazing. It was also during those years that we had some elections. And one of the things that Amina experienced was some really some strong hatred by people in the community. Amina carried that with her and learned from that. But she also thrived in ways that, she, that we never thought. So where is Amina today? She went to Harvard, got her master's. And she's now serving as a public policy analyst and advocate in the city of Chicago for the underserved students of Chicago. She seized an opportunity. The last person is, is Sona. And Sona was fun. She, she's, she's in 2005. Um, Sona was a dance and sociology major. And so she was literally one of these persons that had this magnetic quality about her that you would just gravitate to. She went to Vienna Summer School and was part of the Vienna Summer School. She was part of the Phelps Scholars, um, and she was at one of the Delta Sigma Thetas. Her life was tough after she left Hope, and part of it was because of what Hope did here. But part of it was she seized the opportunities of what she learned here, and she too now is an advocate for the African-American community and for women in the African-American community in Chicago. One of the lessons I learned is Hope Colleges will seize the opportunity. And I can tell you on that first list, time and time again, of what that looks like. I gotta remember my clicker here, not sure. Um, Will Nettleton. Um, Will Nettleton was a little guy, um, always was a little guy, always and was really involved. Um, he was biology, he was quiet, hardworking, unassuming, he came from um, Battle Creek, Michigan. And I'd always see Will, and he'd always have a smile on his face and, and really interesting questions to ask. After he graduated from, from uh, Hope, before he went on to medical school, he went to India. And um, um, while in India, uh, he, he, he did some writing. And I don't know if Will's watching this or not, but, but part of the writing I still have. And what he wrote is he wrote, Broken World and Broken Computer. And I'm going to read some of it. And this is when he is doing um, public health work in, 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 in um, Delhi. I saw another reality of our broken world as I walked to work. I came across a man dragging a woman by her hair. Her face was agonized. agonized. The man kicked his wife in the back as she lay on the ground. She wailed. The man hit his wife. I pulled out my cell phone and remembered the emergency number 100. I handed the phone to my Hindi-speaking neighbor. He handed it back. I tried again to get my neighbor to call. He said, I won't. He then went on to say, it's everyone's problem. I appealed to everybody in the group. No one listened and no one thought anything of it. I left angry and disappointed. Why in the hell would anyone not want to help resolve this ongoing blatant public display of domestic violence? All I asked for was for them to make a phone call. He goes on to say, but I believe in God who commands me to love thy neighbor and love in this case requires actions. Although ultimately I failed in doing anything, the parable of the Good Samaritan is repeated to me almost every day. It caused me to rethink my religious pluralistic leanings. Indian culture, religion seems to be lacking a consistent concept of civil society. One person told me that the concept of altruism and voluntary is a completely foreign idea for some. He ends by saying, the world is still broken, my computer is too but at least I can call a repairman. So Will went on to medical school at Wayne State. He did his residency out in the state of Oregon. He is now uh, a faculty member at Western Michigan Medical School. He is a director of um, public health in the county of Kalamazoo, and he's doing what he wants to do, is serve others and help them make it right. 
Will is that person that just makes the world a better place. He has accepted his call from God to be a repairman. That's what he's done. Lydia Berkey um, is another one of my, my friends. Many of you know Lydia. She graduated in 2019. And for those of you know Lydia, she is larger than life in so many ways. And we're so blessed to have her. Some of you know that, that Lydia was adopted. And she was adopted to a family in Detroit and, and had to navigate being an African-American, being adopted into a white family. And that was not easy and never was easy for Lydia. She persevered here. She got her bachelor's in social work and was part of Dance Marathon, did immersion trips, SAC, um, and she was the first um, chief of culture and inclusion. So she, she set the standard for us. So where's Lydia today? Well, she's out in Pennsylvania now, and she is a caseworker for a children's home of abused children. And that's not enough. She also, on the weekends, she is a person that works with abused women. And she is also consulting families who want to adopt biracial children. And she's getting her master's in social work at Rutgers. This is the calling that she had. This is what she does. And this is because of Hope College. The last person is Holly Thompson. Holly Thompson um, uh, graduated in 2015, and, and she was in college course. Um, she was an environmental studies and sociology major. Um, she was a little petite thing, maybe 4'8 at the most, maybe 90 pounds at the most. Um, just this little bitty thing. Um, amazing faith, uh, strong member of InterVarsity. Holly had a way of um, taking on the big issues. One of the things that she did one summer was to go down to Rio de Janeiro. And in Rio de Janeiro, what she did was she, she, she worked with a group of uh, lawyers and attorneys to attack uh, the issue of trafficking of prostitutes in, in the country of Brazil. So here's this little bitty person doing this really big work with this really big heart. And it's all because of her faith. From Hope, then she went to Vanderbilt. Not a small school, pretty good school. And she excelled in their law school, graduated number two in her class. Amazing, just amazing. So where's Holly today? It only gets better, folks. She's a staff attorney for legal aid in North Carolina, doing civil rights work, and again, um, pushing on trafficking of women. Again, you know, for me, this is, this is you. This is all of you. So this, these are your stories, right? This is creating change. You know, this is impact. This is what Hope students do. They are educated. They have lives of faith. They have this opportunity to change, and they step into it. And they don't step into it meekly, folks. They don't step into it meekly at all. I mean, they step into it with, with conviction. And as President Boltman would say, bring it on, baby. That's what all college kids do. Um, these are the students that died too early. These are the students that, that over my 33 years have passed away. And Peter and Ben... Emma and David and Darcy and Paul and JP and Ruth, Riley and Nancy. You never know what God has planned for any one of us. When their family sent their kids here, they never thought they would not come home or they would not graduate. But the reality is, is that it's up to God to make those decisions. And we have to do the very best that we can to do that with him in the way we can. I've been with the families. Susan, I've been to their homes. We have planted trees for these kids. But there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of one of them. Moments are important. And moments are things you got to treasure each and every day. When I leave, they go with me. And they'll always go with me. 
I cannot tell you how humble it is to be with a family when they bring you into their home and they say, you did everything you could or it's not your fault when you know in your heart that you should have done something more. And so for me, these are these things that, that you have to be willing to kind of own. And in life, those are things that are important. You know, I know this evening there's one individual here who I know well and, and is going through some of this themselves. And my heart is with them, and that, that heart is, is there with them. And so those are things that we need to understand, is that it's about each one of us and, and who we are. And this leads me to perhaps the most important gift of all. It's faith, folks. And faith is our rock, and it's a lifetime journey. I couldn't have gotten through any of my work or any of the things that I've done without my faith. Students are great teachers. They really are, because they look at faith, and they look at this as a way of learning, and you're still asking questions. I think sometimes when we get old and we think about it, we think we have the answers. I don't have the answers yet, and I keep looking for those answers. But these are people that gave me some answers. These are some people that brought me some answers. Many of you know Natalie Brown, um, a graduate of Hope. And some of the things that Natalie talked to me about was how to be still and listen and see the faithfulness of God. All of you know that I hate, I hate phones. I hate phones with a passion, you know. Because it makes me want, it doesn't, it doesn't help me be still, you know. You're always leaning into it. You're always touching it, you know. If it's, if it's next to you by your bedside and, and buzzes, there you go again, right? So one of the things that Natalie and I would sit and talk about is be still and listen. What does it mean to be still and listen? She helped me with that. She talked about the uncomplicated love of God. She says, you're making it too big, Richard. You're making it too difficult. He just loves you. I go, how could he love me? He says, he just does. Okay. And then he says, she always would say, Christ is running right there with you, Richard. And sometimes he's running with you, and sometimes he's running in front of you. Don't ever forget that. After graduation, um, Natalie went to work for Sojourner's Truth in Washington, D.C. And one of her Thursday thoughts, and one of her weekly reflections, she writes this. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Feels a lot more like wishful thinking than biblical mandate. In the heart of this city, there is both the yearning for change and the fear it will never come. I do not always feel hopeful for this place or its people. How can I choose hope when so many people live below the poverty line and my time continues to fill me with me too? How can I choose hope when so much, so much feels hopeless? It's the midst of all of this was broken. I am forced to confront the size of my incapable hands. In Deuteronomy 8, the Israelites are given a call to remember. Do not forget the Lord, repeats. Do not forget the times I have carried you. Do not forget my provision. Do not forget my protection. Do not forget me. I can't help but think the same is true for us today, about how often we forget him. Natalie says, don't ever forget. Bryant Ross. He was in my first FYS. Uh, he is a character, still is. Uh, you can see by the look on his face um, of what he is. Um, he, he, he literally is remarkable. Um, and one of the things that Bryant would say is, we haven't even begun to surface just who God is. And what he's talking about is how big God is. That sometimes we make him our own small guy, right? And Bryant would say, he's big, Richard. Let him be big. He's got the answers. Let him answer those questions. You just worry about Richard. Be faithful what God gives you. One of the things that Bryant would always say is, it's really easy to get distracted by the shiny things of life. You know, um, the bigger, bigger job, the more money, the bigger house, the bigger this, the bigger this. He says, but what does God give you? He gives you your family. He gives you the opportunity. But if you're always looking somewhere else, you're going to miss it. And Brian would say, look what's right in front of you, Richard. And then he talks about 
the lack of compassion we have for one another. And he writes this, Investing in the work and the people right in front of you is called faithfulness. And faithfulness is best supported by God. When you are faithful with a little as a member of Christ's body, God works in powerful ways to bring about the change he wants for the world. So all Brian was saying is, Richard, just be a little faithful in what you do. Just do that little thing, and you'll change that. And so for Brian, you know, I love him. And, and uh, he, he and I get together often with his multiple girls that he has. The last one is Hope Reynolds, and, and some of you know Hope Reynolds, and she just graduated and, and spoke at commencement a year ago, and, and Hope just visited me um, in between semesters. Hope is a, a breast cancer survivor of radical breast cancer um, and is really doing amazing things. And one of the things that we talked about was how did she get through it? And she says, Richard, you just get through things. That's pretty simple. And I go, not quite that easy. Last year at graduation, um, um, President Scogan um, offered uh, the opportunity for, for Hope to speak, and, and she wrote these words. I fully believe that the ability to hope is the greatest gift God has given us because through our faith in God, we have hope enables us to get through our toughest times. And I certainly understand that from the work that I've done over those years. But how can she do this is one of those other lessons. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you all that I remained positive throughout the entire journey because I didn't. I was angry at God thinking, why me? Romans 12.12 12 tells us, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayers. And as we begin our lives outside of Hope College, remember even in your toughest of times that you're not alone. Faith is one of those lessons that I learned from Hope students. So, students, how will you measure your lives? I think it's a pretty interesting question. Are you going to measure it by the income? Are you going to measure it by your title? Or are you going to measure it by what you want to be? I would hope you'd measure it by seizing the opportunities and live with purpose. Excellence happens by a choice, not by chance. So often in life, we let things go by chance. And I would say, be a chooser and make your choices wisely. Be humbly bold and create impact. Moments matter. matter. The will of God is hard work. Lean in and be fierce. Be grateful in all things. Faith is your rock, and it's a lifelong journey. Students, you get one chance. You know, for me, I got one chance to be here, to be with you tonight. You know, what do you make of your day is your choice. I want you to be fierce. The world you're walking into is difficult. Every generation says, well, it's your problem. And there's some truth in that statement. But the only way we're going to get through this is by seizing the opportunities like your predecessors did. The only way you're going to do that is by willing to be humble and create impact. The only way we're going to do that is by having faith. You know, so for you as students, this is your choice. But don't ever let it be a chance. The other part for me is, is that I think there's lessons for my colleagues. Our students want to be part of their whole Hope College journey. This has never been more true. These are exceedingly bright people. Exceedingly bright people. They want to contribute. They want to be part of us. They want to engage us. They want to recognize that they have lessons and insights that will enable Hope College to be excellent and that be innovative. Be willing to change. Embrace their journey with the Christian faith, listening, sharing, and exploring God. Understand that each day we need to commit ourselves to deserving them and their investments in those of the families. You know, as students, I try to always deserve you. I just can't say it's just about me because it's always been about you. See and, see and embrace the complexity of their stories with curiosity and love. 
And another thing Dr. Bowman always taught me, it's a privilege to work at Hope College. It really is. And most importantly, it's a privilege to, to be your dean. You know, and so as I end my time, I just want to say thank you to all the students that I've served over the years and all the things that they've taught me of seizing the day, of making change and faith. I would not be the person I am without you. And I'll never be the person that I can become without you. So for me, my eternal gratitude goes to each one of the students over my 33 years and the five plus lists that I could go back to that I won't. I want to say thank you again to Mortarboard. It's an honor and a privilege to have been asked, and I appreciate you very much. So thank you. have some time for Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and then we'll try to get the, the mic to you guys. No question. <laughs> I, I know you've, you've really dealt with some very, very difficult situations. But I gotta believe there's some pretty funny ones, and maybe there's a funny thing that you can repeat to this group. Um, so I, 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 we had just kind of arrived from California, and, and this was kind of in my first fall of '89. And um, there's a parking lot just behind Skiles, and that parking lot used to have houses on it. And so it's considered off-campus housing. And at the time, the, um, the students that lived there um, happened, he was the student congress president, happened to be his name, John. I will not use his last name. <laughs> um, and so I got a phone call from uh, Chief Lindstrom, who was the chief of police at the time. And he says, well, Dean, you know, I have not met you yet, but we have a little bit of a problem, and, and we have an issue. So I said, okay, what do we do? And this is where Susan says, just go. And so I just go. And so I meet Chief Lindstrom. And, and here my student congress president is hosting a party with 250 students. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was not one of my finest hours. Uh, or, jo or John's finest hour. Um, you know, but, but it, it, you know, it, 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 you know it's, it's those kinds of things where you, you have to have presence, right? I think those are those things that you have to, you, 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 you cannot not show up, you know? And I think that's that thing is you, you have to show up um, and be present in those things. Um, yeah, I, I'll, and maybe I'll just stop there. I think there, <laughs> there, there, are, there are some others, but uh, I mean, the, uh, the other one is, yeah. One of the, the all-time great ones was when um, Carl with the FSAE, um, we were taking it down to Gingerman, which is a race course. And um, President Boatman came down because he likes to drive cars. He used to drive from Iowa in his little Miata quite often in the summer when he was the president out at Northwestern. And um, for those of you who've never done FSAE, I mean, it's the real deal. It's the whole thing. I mean, it's the fire retardant suit. It's the multiple seat belts. It's, it's the real thing. And um, I'll never forget, you know, President Boatman hops in the car and he's all set to go. And, and then a student had to buckle him in. And it was a pretty uncomfortable buckle. That's all I'll say to that. <laughs> but I mean, there's a great sport about it, right? So because it's about students, again. You know, so for me, this is... The, this is whether it be President Scogan or President Bowman, this is what we do. This is why we love you so much. But that was a great day. And he did a great job. And he was able to, to drive that car like nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens.
<laughs> I wasn't sure of my job security that day. <laughs> All right, Richard, I can't believe that uh, you didn't tell him no matter what, don't let him have the microphone, okay? <laughs> um, hope is a place of tradition, many great traditions, wonderful. But I have a question that goes in a different direction. You've been here for 33 years now. What do you consider to be in those 33 years the most important change that has occurred at Hope College? I mean, I think it's, it's fairly, for me, it's fairly easy. And, and that was the decision by the Board of Trustees in 1993-94 to kind of bring back campus ministries in really a robust way. I mean, I think that is one of those things that's been a real bellwether. When you look at the institution's history, you know, when President Van Wylen came, you know, we really kind of moved in terms of some really significant ways in terms of re becoming a research one institution with, with every department across the campus. And so I think that was that piece that we did within the academic community. And when I came in 1989, you know, campus ministries was, was important, um, but it was... Um, it was, it was not robust, it was, it was not, it was not, um, it was not fit, you know. Uh, Chaplain Van Heest was great, and Scott and that whole team was a good, good team. But when the board really said, we really want to bring back a vibrant Christian community to the campus, that has really been that really significant thing when I look at it as one of those kind of key cornerstones that, that we're so grateful for. So I would say that would be it. This is it, folks. <laughs> so is there something you would tell yourself when you first assumed your role as Dean Frost? And then how would you then relay that message to the next dean? Mm -hmm. Um. I think, it's, I think it's true for all of us. I think one of the things is that we really need to be authentically who we are. I mean, and I think that authenticity is really critical in life. I think so many times we're inauthentic because of our insecurities, um, what's expected of us, whether we feel we fit or we don't fit, and in some cases we don't fit. Um, and, it, and it's very difficult for persons of color, um, for a, um, some of our other students who are on the margins to fit, right? And so they can't be their authentic selves. And so one of the things for me as the dean is really one for them to be authentic, but then for also them to welcome any student to be authentic in, in that office that, that, that I sit in, is, is that I am not just the dean of some students. You know, when you assume responsibility for that, it's like you are the dean of every student. You don't get to make the decisions as to who comes. My friend Nate continues to kind of give us these robust opportunities and more robust opportunities and more, but we'll talk about that later. But, but I think the thing for me is I have to welcome them. I have to create a sense of belonging. You know, it, it is not mine to say, this is not your place. This is their place. You know, so for me, for all of you, I think trying to find that authenticity is really critical and then allowing those that are with you to be authentic. Richard, who is your favorite vice president? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, if you know Richard, you know that sometimes in meetings he is uh, writing thank you notes. Um, you're very generous with your gratitude and with your thank you notes. And I just wonder if you can reflect um, on the importance of gratitude and what, that has, what role that has played in your professional and personal life. Um, you know, for, for, for us, it, you know, it comes from my mom and dad, you know, and, and I think my mom and dad are, were our past and, you know, my dad was in, you know, World War II and, and my mom came from a little farm in Minnesota and 
went through the depression, and you don't have a whole lot. And so for them, part of our life was gratitude. And part of our life was always giving thanks for those things that we got. And so that was that thing that, you know, we kind of grew up with. And it was always important to be grateful for both small and large, right? And, and to me, that has really kind of shaped who I am because one of the things, and there's a great article um, that my dad shared, is it more blessed to give than to receive? And some one of the things that happened to me one time was a student came to me and, and, and I had done something for them. It was probably not a major thing to do, a lockout or you know, something like that. And I said, and he just says, thanks for being there for me, right? And I said, no big deal. And he kind of turned to Mac, back to me and he says, at least have the humility to accept my thanks. You, you have to be willing to hold those things. You have to be willing to embrace and see those things if you're going to do, if you're going to do this job. You know, if you're going to do it the way in which I believe it to be done, right? And so for me, that student really was saying, Richard, you're just a, you know, you're too, up, you're too good for me. And so I learned really quickly is, is that I have to be willing to accept whatever is given as a gift. And so whatever that gift may look like, you know, I have to receive it as it's given and in spirit which is given, which is really important in life. Because I think all too often... We, we think about how grand gifts are, when in some cases, a thank you is all they can give. You know? And so for me, I, was a, I, I wasn't very good that day. You know? So gratitude is that place that I think in my heart, if I can start my day and end my day with giving thanks for my Savior, giving thanks for my family, giving thanks for Hope College, and giving thanks for my students, I'm good. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Hi, Dean Frost. Hi. Um, I was wondering, for those of us who still have time here, faculty, staff, and students, if, if you had a say in the goals that come next for Hope College, what goals would you suggest? Um, where, where's my provost? No. <laughs> He's sitting in the back now, folks. He's sitting in the back. Um, I, I, think, I, th I think with President Skogan and, and, and Provost Griffin and, and the rest of the team as it gets assembled, is that hope is at another pivotal point. You know, it, it really is this point where the president has really kind of given us this hope forward vision, but he's also talked about, you know, the world of learning and the world of work. Those two things need to be as robust as, as, as hope forward. Because the learning that you folks are doing today and the learning you're going to need to go out into this world is really dynamic and it's changing. One of the things that I love about our provost, your provost, get to know him, you know, is that I really want you to hear the word he loves. One of the words that he's taught me about is being intrusive. You need to be intrusive with your learning. Don't accept it just as it is. Be intrusive in your learning. If you don't have a relationship you want with the faculty, be intrusive in it, you know. I think that's one of the things that, that the academic community is going to have to kind of figure out and really work in because... The world is changing so rapidly that it's being transformed every day. When you look at Pfizer uh, and what they did with vaccines, how many years did it take to do the other ones? And we do it in 18 months or 12 months? I don't know. It's, it's not the same place. When you look at BP in the back with the world and, and, and the water levels rising, I mean, we're in real trouble, you know? What is that going to look like, right? So we have to find a way to provide a meaningful opportunity for you to learn differently that's going to allow you to be intrusive. So I think that's one. The second kind of thing that I think is really important is how do we find ways to have really increasing uh, meaningful dialogue. You know, one of my good friends says, people who care can talk about things that matter. You know? 
Don't worry about talking about things that matter. Worry about the care question. Do we really love one another? Do we really care for one another? Are we really willing to sacrifice for one another? Because only when I see you, see you, can I care about you. So part of it is the ability to see things in that way and in that time. So I think, you know, for me, that's where I guess I would hope the college would lean into and really kind of put some time and some energy into, into, into really thinking about that, you know. The faculty, the staff, you as students, I think are ready for that. And I think the third piece for me is, is how do we embrace a different kind of um, ecology of thinking together, you know. So what does it mean for us to sit with students, meaning the staff and the faculty and the students sitting together at one table? I was with some of the student congress folks last night, and one of the things that they talked about was, you know, we now know that we have a chair that we can sit at any table. And I would encourage everybody to understand that, that the student voice is really critical today because how they see the world is different than how I see it. They understand it differently. And they're willing to engage, but are we brave enough to do that with them? Or are we and get stuck in where we are? So for me, I think that would be what I would say. Okay, this is the last question. One question you always ask me every time we see each other is, how am I making time for Ethan? So my question for you is, how are you slowing down? How are you discerning? <laughs> how are you making time for Richard? Um, or how have you done it through being a dean through retirement, kind of through these different transitions in life. So today I walked with Kylie. We took a long walk, and, and there's, a, there's a really interesting book out. It's about uh, 4,000 weeks. And, and the whole concept about time management is really trying to do more in the, t the hours we have. And what the author is really kind of saying is what you really need to do is throw that away. It doesn't help you. You just try to put more and more and more and more in. What he says is really important is to discern what is really important to really think about what's important and recognize you're never going to be able to do everything anyways. So once you accept that, then you can really begin thinking about what is important, right? And so for me, I think those are the things that in my life I've really tried to do. And I think there's kind of three things of importance for me. You know, one is my family, two is my faith, and three is my students. And that's what's important, you know? And, and that's, what I'm going to, that's what I spend my time doing, you know? And I think it's also important to, to realize that when you have, when you care about things, that's where you find your heart, right? That's where you find what's important, you know? And so for me, doing those things can be small and large, right? So when Jennifer asks about my notes, you know, it, 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 I, I, I think it's important because it's a personal gesture, and, and President Bolton did a lot of this during his time, and he'd write notes all the time. And um, it, takes, it doesn't take a long time. What it takes is a little bit of care. So what does it mean to care, right? And so again, it's writing that. All of you in my first year seminar, we write letters. I ask you to write the letters home to your family or your friends because that's important to me. Take time to do that. It doesn't take a long time. But boy, I can tell you, I still have the birthday cards, right? Or the Father's Day cards, you know? Of, of things like that, that's what's important, you know. You know, so, so for me, I think I'm doing that, Ethan. You know, I think I'm, I'm kind of trying to find that space, um, recognizing that I won't be able to do everything, you know. Um, what I look forward to is, is I do retire, or I do move into some different work for the college for a year, is that I can do some different things, you know. Uh, my Christmas card list for students is about 1,000. So this, this year, maybe I'll have a longer, a better time to kind of to write those cards, right? And those are the kinds of things that, that make a difference. Whether the students write back to me, it doesn't matter. What they need to know, what you need to know, every one of you as students, is that you're important. And there's a place called Hope that's always going to welcome their arms back for you. And that you are loved here, and you'll always be loved here. Thank you very much. Part, 
pardon me, Richard, but I, I just I feel inclined to say something on behalf of all of us, and that's a big thank you to you. I had the privilege of working with you for 14 years, and you've taught all of us something. Tonight, for me, was a perfect night because you got to see Richard Frost in a way that you don't get to see him very often. And what you've taught us and me is encapsulated in the word empathy. In my experience, I have never seen any person who is able to empathize as well as you do. And you did it for all of us for these 33 years. Hope students had the privilege of knowing that their dean of students really cared about them, that he empathized with them. And you've taught us tonight. You said that you learned lessons from others. Well, we learned something from you, too. And this is the part that you probably wouldn't have much opportunity to observe, but Richard was the point person for all the crises that ever happened on campus. And I must confess, as president, I went home at night and I did my work, but I wasn't really concerned about everything that could go wrong. But sitting in his chair, he had the telephone that brought the kind of news that demanded empathy. And I've seen him with parents in the worst kind of situations when a child is taken too early. I've seen him when kids get in trouble. And I just want all of you to know that you had a dean of students who really cared about you. And he empathized with every situation you were in. And for that, Richard, all of us are deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.